it's a bit awkward, right? <laughs> when you're, I'm here, you're here, you have this feeling that something should be happening and nothing's going on, right? And you're, you're just sitting there and you're waiting for things to, go, to get moving, right? And, and, I, and I'm here today because that's really how I, about how I feel about the environment. Right? And I could choose a ton of problems with the environment right now, but the one that I think is really the big challenge of our generation and what needs to be solved is the idea of global warming. We know the temperatures everywhere are rising up. It's upsetting agriculture, uh, water levels. It's going to change a lot of things if we don't solve this. And, and we know that really the culprit for this is our reliance on fossil fuels. We're burning carbon-based fuels we're emitting more and more carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And so the temperature of the planet is increasing. And, and, and why do I care? Well, my reason is really, really selfish. It's not, it's not for other people. It's not for grandiose. It's I like mountaineering. That's my passion, going in the background, in the, in the back country, in our beautiful Rocky Mountains, and going on glaciated mountains, just hiking, skiing, uh, exploring that background that we have. A and, and this sort of really struck me, it was on Facebook last year, Parks Canada, and they said that the Athabasca Glacier, which a lot of you have probably driven by, it's on the Icefield Parkway where tourists go up on the buses, and uh, it says that it's losing six meters of ice every year. Not, not melting and regaining, losing six meters of ice every year. And, and so, that's probably the scariest picture I've ever taken to me. Because what you're seeing is a geological event happening in the lifetime, right? And, and what scares me is when I look at this, I wonder, will I be alive when we can no longer see that glacier? That scares me and it pisses me off. So I want to do something about this. And I, I'm not the only person that is doing something about this. We've seen an increased rise in the use of clean energy, whether it's wind, whether it's solar. We're seeing solar farms pop up everywhere. Germany has embraced solar energy. Uh, you go around Lethbridge, you have all those wind farms. A and renewable energy is beautiful because it's there, it's plentiful, it's completely emission free. But the problem with a lot of these, and here I'm just using wind as an example, just because it's sunny and windy doesn't mean you need the energy. Right? And if it's cold and there is no wind, you don't have that energy available. A and that becomes a huge problem because there is absolutely no match between supply and demand of clean, renewable energy. And when you think about it, we have reserves of everything. Right? We have reserves of oils, large, vast reserves of oil. Not even what's in the ground, just what we have in barrel that we're ready to use. We all have at home, we have our refrigerators, we have our pantry, we have reserves of food at home. A and just to be prepared, I'm sure all of you have extra socks in your drawers. <laughs> so how much reserves of clean energy do we have? Actually, almost none. It's not something we do. We don't store clean, renewable energy. And it's really what we need to do if we want to be able to fix that mismatch between supply and demand. We need to store it when we have it. And nature has figured that out a long time ago, and this is what photosynthesis does. Takes the, the clean energy from the sun, uses that energy when it's available, and the plant is going to take some simple molecules that are available, water, carbon dioxide, and that beautiful little energy factory that is a leaf, it's going to be able to convert it into a chemical fuel, complex sugars, cellulose. Stores it there when it doesn't need it. When the light goes off, it takes those sugars, reuses them, and now it has a supply of energy when it has a need, right? And, and a nice side product is we get clean air from the whole process. <laughs> okay, so, so this sounds like a chemistry problem, and I'm a chemist. So I look at that and I think, well, okay, I have a skill set that allows me to work on trying to do this. We're not going to try to make complex sugars. The first hint is the word complex, right? <laughs> They're, they're not easy to do, and photosynthesis has taken you know, a long time to be perfectioned. 
But we can look at what can we do that's simpler, but that does the same idea of using a plentiful resource and, sto and using it to store energy. And this process is known as water splitting. It's not something new. This is probably how electricity was discovered in the 1700s. So this is one of the oldest electrochemical reaction that we know. But we can take the most abundant resource on our planet. We can take water. And if we apply energy to it, we can break water, which is H2O, into its two element gases, which is hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is a fuel. We can burn it. We can use it as a, in a fuel cell. And we can store it, right? And again, we get oxygen, which is always nice. And, 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 and now that we've stored that, we can use that and release that energy that we've put in when we need it. So this all sounds great, so why is this not happening? Why aren't we doing this? Well, the fact is going up in energy from water to hydrogen costs a lot of energy. It's not an efficient process. And it's not scalable because the materials that are used to do this are relying on very expensive materials like iridium and platinum. And if you've shopped for an iridium ring, <laughs> you know that you cheap out and go for gold, right? <laughs> and, and so that has been hindering why, why this hasn't really picked up. And so to be able to lower that energy input that we put in, so the efficiency of this process, what we need is what's called a catalyst. And the best way of thinking of what a catalyst is, is a road through the mountains, okay? If I'm going from Calgary to Vancouver, I have two ways. I can just screw it, I'm going in a straight line, I'm gonna go over every mountain top, I'm gonna off-road it, and I'm gonna get to Vancouver. <laughs> and you can, right? But what do we do? We, we, we take roads. We've, we've created something that allows us to take an easier path following the valley, the valley bottoms that gets us to the exact same point that we want to get to but in a much more efficient way. So in chemistry, that's what a catalyst does. It gets you from point A to B, but in a different way that is more energy efficient. So if we want to do water splitting efficiently, we need the right catalyst. So the research we've done is looking into developing catalysts to do exactly just that. And when you look, our breakthrough is really hindering on two principles. So a catalyst is just a substance. Usually it's a metal oxide, so fairly simple material to work with. Uh, and scientists like to work with what are called crystalline materials, which are materials that have a really uh, periodic structure. There's an atom here, there's an atom here, there's an atom here. I know how things are controlled. And scientists like that. We like to control things, we like to understand things, and then do little changes to see how things change. You know, that's the basis of the scientific method. One of the things that we've done that a lot of scientists don't like to do because it brings them out of their comfort zone is we've gone to what's called an amorphous material, which is essentially completely disordered. You know, there's an atom here, the other one could be here, the other one could be here, the other one could be here. Don't really know, right? Makes it harder to study, because we don't have that control. We don't really know what we're dealing with. The other thing that happens is it's filled with defects. Some atoms are missing in some places. Actually, it turns out that those defects makes the catalyst more reactive. Even though it has exactly the same composition as the crystalline material, it reacts faster, better, more efficiently. So that's one of the first things we did. And we found that whatever composition we make with the amorphous beats the crystalline uh, little brother in every case we've tried. The second thing is when you, we look at how we make materials, as a chemist, this is my list of ingredients. It's the periodic table. So again, I said we don't want to rely on, on uh, expensive metals or materials. So we're, we're, we're going to target something that's dirt cheap. So we're going to go with iron, primarily because that's what dirt is made of. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and iron is everywhere. It's the fourth most abundant element on the planet. It's the uh, most abundant metal. Right? That's why it's so cheap. And, 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 and we can start with iron. That's a, that was our good starting point. And then what we were able to do is we'll just add some cobalt in there. And, and so now I can go and I can make various compositions. I can have more cobalt, less cobalt, equal amounts of iron and cobalt. Then I, I say, okay, that, that's nice. And, and I can go and I can try still starting from iron. I'm going, oh, okay, I, I want to try some nickel. So I'm going to do the same old song and dance. I'm going to mix different amounts of iron and nickel. And then for the heck of it, 
I'm just going to go start with cobalt, my iron that I like, add nickel. And again, I can do this song and dance now just with three different elements. This sounds like something that is extremely simple, and that has been somebody that nobody has been able to do for the pursuit of efficient water splitting amorphous catalysts, and that's what we've been able to do. So to put it in broad perspective, let's think of it in terms of cooking. Okay, so if I start with bland noodles, bland noodles will feed me. Is it great? No, you know, bland noodles doesn't do much. Uh, it gets the job done. But if you start to add a few things to it, right? I get a tomato, I get some cheese, some salt, some herbs, mix that all together, make a beautiful sauce, stick it on top of, and now by being able to control ingredients and putting whatever ingredient I want in whatever proportion I want, now I can make a really beautiful meal, right? In terms of chemistry, that's what we've been able to do. Before we started, there was essentially four amorphous metal oxide catalysts known. We have now tr tried thousands of them because we have 80% of the periodic table that we can mix and match in whatever composition we can. So now we're, we're, we're looking and we're trying to find, well, which recipe is the best? Just like when you start cooking, right? You try something, it's like, ah, it's terrible, throw it away. Or you try something, it's like, all right, I'm into something and I'm gonna add something else. So that's the kind of research we're doing right now. So we can make these materials and we can test them. And what we're finding is our first generation of materials of electrocatalysts that are based on abundant dirt cheap metals are right now the new state of the art. And we're blowing everybody out of the water. Right? So these two things together have really given us the breakthrough of what we're working on. So I really just want to finish about going back to the beginning that you want something to happen. And really what I want to leave you with is, is a message of, you know, don't wait for a report. Don't wait for governmental leadership to tell you we need to do something about the environment. Find a reason that, that is dear to you, that pisses you off, that gets you riled up, that you're like, I want to do something. And then you look at what you can do. I'm a chemist, so I went to chemistry, because that's what's in my skill set. But it can be very sim something very simple, like walk to the grocery stores, turn off the light when you go out, right? Everybody can do something, but you need to find your own motivation. If you don't care about it, you won't do it, right? So I'm not doing this for you guys, I'm not doing this for anybody else, except for maybe my future kids. Because when I go up in mountaineering, I want to be able to show them Mount Victoria and that they see a beautiful glacier. I don't want to tell them, when I was young, <laughs> there was a glacier there. Okay. Thank you very much.